Hello, friends. Robert Bevan here, author of the Caverns and Creatures series of comedy fantasy novels and short stories. Uh, with me is Cameron, a.k.a. Prince Phantom, and he has another fun build for us. Yes. Uh, this this so, one uh, is focused on the cantrip Shillele. Yes, so Shillele, a very difficult to pronounce cantrip, and uh, one that has been very difficult for a lot of players to wrap their heads around how exactly to be to make the most use of it so the big problem with the cantrip is that it's only available to druids and it's druids don't get extra attack druids are not a melee fighting focused class moon druids can maybe make an exception to that but that's in wild shape they're not doing that while they're normal so the Question then is how do we make the most use out of shillelagh? Because it offers a lot of benefits. So let's talk about shillelagh itself. Yeah, I've always thought about shillelagh as just, I mean, it's a cantrip. It's not supposed yes. to be the most powerful thing in the world. It's like, all right, if you don't have any weapons, you can find a stick in the woods and uh, you know, you've always got that going for you. Yeah. It's like a, like and, a last resort kind of thing. But And that's not bad for druids from, for, from level one to four because nobody has extra attack at that point. Mm hmm. So for Druids level 1 to 4, it's a fine utility cantrip. You can use it. Um, it'll make you decent at fighting, which is all you should really expect from a cantrip. Yeah. But we want to push that further. We want to take this to its logical extreme. So, Shalele is a uh, casting time of one bonus action. Um, it targets a club or quarter staff. We'll be using a quarter staff, and I'll explain why later. Um, it lasts for one minute. And it is normally only available to druids. We will circumvent that. <laughs> so it says the wood of a club or quarterstaff you're holding is imbued with nature's power. For the ration, you can use your spell casting ability instead of strength for the attack and damage rolls of melee attacks using that weapon. And the weapon's damage die becomes a d8. The weapon also becomes magical if it isn't already. So the spell ends if you cast it again or let go of the weapon. Okay. So it's a pretty simple spell. Um, basically, whatever your spellcasting ability is, wisdom, intelligence, or charisma, you now attack with that. Uh, I'll go ahead and spoil. We'll be using wisdom. So okay. we will be attacking with our wisdom stat, which is very cool. It allows us to dump most of our stats when at character creation into wisdom, not having to focus near as much on strength or dexterity. We'll focus a little bit of ex on dexterity, but that's to fill out armor. So, but not near as much as we would normally have to, as a as the character class we're mostly going to be in. Okay. Uh, so, look in this build, uh, strength is pretty much our dump stat. Then. Yep. Yep. Completely. Okay. Um. So, uh, we'll go ahead and we'll get into the build here. So, for race, uh, we're actually going to go with custom origin. Now, if you don't know what custom origin is, it was printed in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. Uh, basically, it is the build your own race. Race. Okay. Um, you can make flavorfully whatever you want, really. Uh, the main benefits of it is that it gives a feat at level one. That feat at level one is supposed to be used to build the flavor of your character. Right. In my opinion, there's not enough feats to actually do that. But topic for a different video. So. Does, we'll uh, take custom I'm origin. Sorry, does does variant human not also give you a feat? It does. There's a the the big difference between custom origin and variant human is in its stat bonuses. So variant human gives two plus ones. Mm -hmm. So you can do a plus one to strength and a plus one to con, for example. Sure. Custom origin gives one plus two. Oh. So the it's one is not inherently better than the other. It's build dependent. Yeah. So for this step, for this one, we want that plus two. So I'll, that'll go ahead and lead into our stats because we are taking a feat at level one that boosts one of our stats. So for ability scores, we are dumping strength. It'll be a nine. It's a nine instead of an eight because when you when you do point by, uh, you have one stat left over. Okay. It's a little complex to understand, but basically I up strength because... If you're running based on rules as written carrying capacity, having a nine strength instead of an eight may allows you to carry a bit more. Okay. That's really it. Yeah, it, yeah, it doesn't matter in 99% of tables. But 
Um, we'll take a nine strength, a 14 dexterity. We'll be wearing medium armor. So we want at least a 14 dexterity. Really, we don't want any more than a 14 dexterity. <clears throat> a 13 constitution, an eight intelligence. We're dumping intelligence. And uh, we will have an 18 wisdom starting out. Whoa. This is accomplished by setting our uh, wisdom to a 15 with point by, mm -hmm. a plus two from custom origin, sure, and a feat, which I'll go ahead and spoil, will be fey touched, giving us another plus one to wisdom for a total of 18. Okay. Um, why fey touched in particular? There are other feats that... We'll get can... to that. Okay. Um, but also, and lastly, a 13 charisma, which will be used for a multi-class later. So now, Fey Touched, let's talk about it. Okay. Fey Touched is a generically good feat for everybody. Nearly sure. everybody. Barbarians, maybe not, but mostly everybody. It gives us a plus one to wisdom, which is actually the main thing we care about here. Mm -hmm. Mostly what I looked for here was what is the best feat that also gives me a plus one to wisdom? And that is Fey Touched. What were uh, it some gives of us... the other options you looked at? Uh, well, there's Shadow Touched. Um, there is... Um, observant is a horrible feat, so I didn't look at that one. Um, there's resilient wisdom, which we will not start this character with wisdom save proficiency, but we will have a very high wisdom, so I didn't feel it necessary. Okay. Um, that's really about it. There's not, I mean, there's there's some feats that allow you to bump any ability score, like skill expert. We're not specializing in a specific skill, so I didn't feel like that was necessary. So Fey Touch gives us the most. It gives us Misty Step. Once per day for free, and we can cast it later with spell slots if we want to, if we have those spell slots. Uh, Misty Step is a great spell. Good get-out-of-jail-free card. And we will be in melee, so sometimes we will want to get out of that jail. Um, and uh, it also gives us one uh, first-level spell of either the Enchantment or Divination Schools. Um, I uh, went ahead and picked Silvery Barbs, which is the best one. Yeah. Um, no if silvery here. barbs is if silvery barbs is banned in your campaign, uh, gift of alacrity, bless. There's a bunch of good ones as well. It's not necessary to the build, but it does help the build a lot because we are going to be forcing saving throws, and silvery barbs allows us to force our enemies to re-roll that saving throw if they succeed it. Yeah. So that's Fey Touch. Um, let's go ahead into level one because this is a. We have a lot to go over here. This sure, is a much sure. more complex build than the last one. We need to keep moving. So our level one will be uh, fighter. We will take fighter at level one. We get constitution saving throw proficiency. It's very important for us because we are going to be concentrating on spells and we're going to be in melee. Yeah, definitely. Two things that normally I don't recommend you do. <laughs> we'll have ways to mitigate that. We'll have ways to be in melee, but also not be in melee. We'll talk about that later. So, Constitution Saving Throw Proficiency, very important. We This is also a character that wants two different fighting styles. Um, that's rare. As you've, gone, as, you've, as you've seen when you've gone through your fighting style videos recently, mm -hmm. and your Martial Mondays, which I have enjoyed. Um, fighting styles are normally pretty... They're one, for one type of character, most of the time. There's some exceptions like defense, but most of the time, they're for one specific type of character. We want two different fighting styles. So, um, we will pick up dueling with our level one fighter. That gives us a plus two to damage rolls while we are holding a weapon in one hand and no other weapon. You can still hold a shield in your other hand, though. Right. So, we'll be holding a quarter staff in one hand and a shield in the other. Sure. That'll be our main character. Um, and this is strict. Right? I mean, all, all this gives you is plus two damage. So, that's, yes, uh... plus two damage. Um, but actually, if you are playing at level one, don't do that. You have a nine strength, and we don't have Shalele yet. Yeah. So instead, grab a longbow, stay at range, and survive level one. Simple as that. All right. So, level two. And also level three. We'll talk about these two. This is when the build really kicks into gear. Uh, we'll be taking Ranger for both of these levels. Now, level one of Ranger doesn't really give us a lot. It gives us Favored Enemy, uh, which gives us an additional D4 once per turn to damage sometimes. 
if you're not concentrating on anything else, sure, go for it, but you probably won't be using it very often. Um, level two of Ranger, though, that's when it kicks into high gear. We will take Druidic Warrior as our fighting style. That will give us access to Shillelagh and one other cantrip. I recommend Magic Stone as it gives us a ranged option that also uses our wisdom when we cannot get into melee with something. Magic Stone will also work with a lot of what we're doing here as it deals bludgeoning damage, which will be important later. And it can also work with any of, the thing, any, of the, any of these things that we're doing. There's a bit of an issue in that you only have three stones and you have to use a bonus action to cast it every turn. And we're eventually going to be making a bunch of attacks every turn. So there can be a little bit of action clutter there. So that's why I don't recommend building your entire build around Magic Stone. No, but yeah. it's good to have it's good to have in your back pocket to pull out when you need it. Uh, I'm curious uh, why? Why instead of going through all this, why not just take a level of Druid to get you level? So the reason we don't want a level of Druid is because we need to get to extra attack quickly. Ah, right. Yeah. Um, we're, we've already delayed it by one level. That won't hurt quite as much as it would most characters because of a reason we'll get to later. But uh, delaying extra attack is very bad for a character that wants to be making attacks. There is a significant power increase in the monster's challenge rating, suggested challenge rating, once you get to level five. When marshals are getting extra attack, full casters are getting third level spells. Fireball, example. Right, right. There's a clear bump in power of the player characters and in the monsters. And so delaying that by a couple of levels means that there's a couple of levels there where we're going to be extremely weak. So taking Druid levels makes that a little bit difficult. Druid also has this really, really annoying thing where they say they don't wear metal armor. Oh, yeah, that's true. Now, there's a big debate online as to if druids can wear metal armor, if that's a flavor thing, if your DM can overrule it, your DM can overrule it if they want to. But I have to write these rules as written. Right, sure. Druids don't wear metal armor. That that's, makes... I mean, that's the, an, I think that's an important distinction. If that's a rule, that's a... I don't, I don't know how you can call it flavor. It's just a... It's, a it's severe, about the wording limitation on a druid yeah it's about the wording um and you'll notice in the new one dnd play test they just give druids proficiency in light armor and shields mm -hmm. they don't even give them medium armor um so you can say that's the intent but then you could make the argument well could i make half plate out of a bug carapace you know it it gets messy and i don't want to get into that in this video yeah well we're not taking druid anyway yeah, and those those are all the reasons why. If you want to take them druid levels, if you can fit it into your character, that's fine. Especially if you take them later on in the character after we get extra attack. There are some benefits there. Not enough that I saw necessary. So um, we'll take um, the last bit of things here from Ranger is we'll get some spells. Uh, my selections are Entangle and Goodberry. Entangle is a decent control spell for this level. Um, cast it restrains a bunch of things. If it doesn't restrain them, they're still stuck in difficult terrain. So, good spell overall. Uh, and uh, good berry. Uh, gives us 10 one-hit point healing berries that can be consumed with an action. Um, you can consume as many of these as you want to. This is a great out-of-combat healing spell. Um, and if your wizard happens to have a familiar, well, then you can give them one of your good berries, and that familiar can then feed it to a downed ally and get them back up with one hit point. So a lot of great things with Goodberry will make it even better in a couple of levels. All right. And uh Entangle is gonna come back to uh you know, Yes. Yeah, Entangle on later. In Entangle we will be continuously building up control spells as this character goes on, and you'll see why here in a minute. So levels four through six, we are a fighter one, and by the end of this, a ranger five. So, we're taking more ranger levels. Uh, we'll pick up our subclass at ranger level 3. We'll be taking Swarmkeeper. Swarmkeeper is personally my favorite ranger subclass. I love it so much. The flavor of it is wonderful. You can flavor the swarm cool. however you want. It can be a swarm of birds, bees, 
I'm personally selecting that, and we'll get into that why. Not necessary for the build whatsoever, just a flavor thing. So um, I love Swarm Keeper, though, because it gives us something to do on every single turn. It gives us a choice on every single turn. Those choices are when we hit a target with an attack, excuse me, the target either takes an extra D6 of piercing damage. It's fine, a good fallback option, not something that we're going to be focusing on. You are moved by the swarm five feet horizontally in a direction of your choice. This, by the way, is a free disengage. This is forced movement. Forced movement does not provoke opportunity attacks. Oh. So, useful to us. Yeah, sure. Um, and the one we will be focusing on most of the time, those other two are nice, we'll use them when we want to, but most of the time, we're going to be doing this third one. So the attack's target must succeed on a strength saving throw against your spell save DC, or be moved by the swarm up to 15 feet horizontally in a direction of your choice. This is why Shalele is so good for us. So a normal ranger has to focus on many different ability scores. You're either focusing on strength or dexterity, constitution, and wisdom. That is three ability scores. If you're doing point by, which is what I assume all these builds are made with, that gets very difficult to have good stats in all three of those things. If you're rolling for stats and you get crazy numbers, sure, whatever. But yeah. that's not most characters. Shalele allows us to completely dump strength, mostly dump wisdom. We're just getting a 14 so we can fill out our medium armor. Well, dexterity. Excuse me, did I say, no, sorry, dexterity. We don't so want dump strength, wisdom. don't dump our wisdom, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's right. Dump strength, mostly dump wisdom. I did it again, dexterity. <laughs> anyway, and now we can focus almost exclusively on our wisdom, and we can still have some points for constitution, and we can even sneak in a little cheeky multi-class. So it adds a lot to what the character's, character is able to do throughout its life. So it also means that our save DC for this is going to be much higher. So at uh, at level character level four, when we'll be picking this up, our proficiency bonus is plus two. So that means our save DC will be a 14. Eight plus two plus four for our wisdom. So our, our save DC will be a 14. That is the save, that is a better save DC than most full casters mm -hmm. at this level. So we're doing really good. And as our proficiency bonus continues to go up, because remember, even though we're multi-classing, our proficiency bonus still goes up at the same rate. Proficiency bonus only cares about what your total level is. Right. So we will continue to make this even better and better. So Shalele, it makes our attacks magical. That's wonderful for a melee fighter. It improves the damage. Normally with a quarter staff would be swinging a D6. Now we're swinging a D8. And it allows us to make our build focused around wisdom and to benefit from that. The reason we take Swarmkeeper in particular is because it benefits so much from wisdom. You can take Gloomstalker and it'll be a good character. You can take Fae Wanderer and it'll be a good character. Those are both very good Ranger subclasses. But Swarmkeeper loves for us to focus on our wisdom. So this character is able to do that. All right, why? And we can reap we, the well, benefits. Sorry. Why does Swarmkeeper ask us to focus on our wisdom? Because we're forcing a strength saving throw against our spell save DC. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And, and there are other things in other ranger subclasses that care about your wisdom. I'm not saying that they don't care about your wisdom. This one, though, gives us something that we care about that we can make a build around. Well, also, I mean, Swarmkeeper, a lot of this build is focused on. Uh, like pushing people around. Yep. And, uh, and yep. That, that so we're building well. around that concept, that yeah. force movement concept. So that's why Entangle is so good. Even if they get exactly. out yeah. of that, we can push them back in. Now, granted, Entangle is only going to provide them difficult terrain at that point. But that's just our first level spell. We're going to be getting better and better and better spells as we go on. So... um at 5th level of Ranger, 6th level overall, we'll get extra attack, which is great. 
And uh, oh, I'm sorry, I skipped something. Uh oh. Uh, at uh, fifth at Ranger four, character level five, we get a feat, which Yay. is very important for us. So the feat that we will be selecting, and the reason that it doesn't hurt us to bump back extra attack by one level is we're taking Polearm Master. So, Polearm Master, for those who don't know, it works with uh, glaives, halberds, spears, and quarterstaffs. Quarterstaffs is what we care about. Absolutely, yes. Yes. So, Polearm Master allows us to, if we make an attack with a quarterstaff, we can then, on our turn, make a bonus action attack with our quarterstaff. Now, that bonus action attack only deals a d4, but it's an extra attack. And the majority of our damage is coming from our ability score our ability score modifier anyway. And you find does, uh, out... Sorry, does the dueling, dueling apply to this one too? Yes, it does. Okay. Yep. So dueling applies to this as well, so we're still getting a plus two to that damage. So let's talk about damage on this character. Because you'll notice... A quarter staff does not qualify for Great Weapon Master. I noticed that, yes. So, if you are building a melee character centered around dealing damage, you cannot make something that doesn't include Great Weapon Master. Because the, the increase to damage that Great Weapon Master provides is so significant that a character without it is noticeably weaker. Sure, yeah. If and I need we need to make this very clear. This character is not going to be dealing the damage that your barbarian in your party that takes great weapon master and is swinging with reckless attack all these times and is dealing 20 plus damage every attack. We're not doing that. We no, that's can't not what those that. characters are about. Exactly. So here's the thing. If you are building a melee character that cannot do damage like that, which we'll still be doing good damage. We won't be doing great damage, though. Right. We need to focus on something else. There needs to be something else to our character that we're bringing to the table. If we can't just do damage, we need to do something else. It's fine to make a character that can't do a ton of damage, but what can you do? So, that's where forced movement comes in. Yes. So, Polearm Master is great for us. It gives us that bonus action attack. And we have to remember, we can only use our forced movement if we hit a creature. So if we miss, that's bad. Yeah. Polearm Master gives us a second chance to hit. Which is great. Once we get extra attack, it gives us a third chance to hit, which is even better. Meaning, realistically, you're probably not going to be missing every attack on your turn. So... Let's go ahead into level five, which I already talked about. The only thing I didn't talk about with level five was that uh, Swarm Keeper gives us the web spell. I love the web spell. I do too. It is one of my favorite second level spells. We also get other great second level spells like Pass Without Trace and Spike Growth, which we'll talk about web and Spike Growth. They're two spells that serve useful, uh, that have useful implications for us, but are useful in different combats. So let's talk about web first. Web. Uh, shoots out a 20-foot diameter web that uh, creatures within the web at the start of their turn have to make a dexterity save or be restrained in the web. Um, you'll notice very similar to Entangle. Yeah. That web is also considered difficult terrain, just like Entangle. Sure. Now, to break free of the web, they must use their action. They don't get a save at the end of their turn like a whole person. They have to use their whole action to try and break free. That is debilitating for most monsters. They want to use their action to hit us. Sure, yeah, yeah. Now they can't do that. They can't even use their action to dash out of the web because they're still in difficult terrain. So, therefore, if they're in that web and can't get out of it by the end of their turn... They have to make another dexterity saving throw, potentially getting trapped in the web again and having to use another action to get out. So web is a wonderful control spell. Love it so much. Never burn it. Ignore the text on it that says you can burn it to deal damage. Never burn a web. That's Don't my favorite that. part. It's I'm, bad. Don't I, do I, it. I, I'm, but still, even like 
if it's about to expire. Might it has well. a minute duration. What combat lasts 10 <laughs> rounds? <laughs> oh, that's... Uh, all right, all right. So, if the, if, anyway. if the creature is beaten to with an inch of its life, just finish it off with fire. Or you could just hit it in the head. Also, if this character has no fun. means of using... This character has no means of dealing fire damage, so kind of a moot point anyway. The, it's got a torch. <laughs> yes, I suppose. Listen, you do with your webs what you will. <laughs> I'm using mine to restrain people. Yeah, that's the better way. So, anyway, the great thing about this is even if a creature gets completely out of the web, they've probably had to use their action to do that. They've used all of their movement to do that. They're probably not that far outside of the web. Certainly not more than 15 feet. What else is so, 15 feet? Our push. Yeah. So, we stride right up to them, crack them over the head with our quarter staff. And they are launched 15 feet right back into that web. So we've basically created an instance where enemies really just can't hardly ever get to us to attack us. It's This is just the beginning of our wonderful uses for force movement. Now, force movement is something sorry, that you guys we, have talked a lot about. Sorry, yeah, just to be clear, um, I would crack them over the head. And what's causing the force movement? Is that the swarm? Yes. Okay, the swarm. Yes. yes. This is, they make a strength saving throw against their spell save DC or be f moved by the swarm 15 feet horizontally in a direction of your choice. Okay. So we're going to choose to push them back into that web. Absolutely. Um, force movement is incredibly powerful in this game. Let's talk about that a little bit because our whole build is centered around it. Yes, there are the examples of use of force movement where you could push somebody off a cliff. There's the examples where you can push somebody into a spike trap. Those aren't in every battle map, are they? Uh, no, but... Oh, I mean, they I should be in more battle map. maps. They should be in more battle maps, to be clear. DMs, put more cliffs, put more spike traps. It's great. I love it. <laughs> Anytime it shows up, it makes me so happy. But they're not in every battle map. So instead, we create the thing that they exactly, don't want yeah. to be in. Um, this build also pairs wonderfully with full casters who are doing this already. If you have a that's wizard true. in your party who's already casting web, well, hey, that saves... Now you don't have to cast it. Now you can go ahead and start making attacks. This build promotes so much teamwork and unity. Talk to the other people in your party, maybe even at character creation. Say, hey, one of you might want to play somebody who plays who uses a lot of control spells. I synergize with that. I can make your control spells even better. I can do all of these things that keep enemies inside of those control spells and puts them back into it when they get out that you will then be an even more effective character. This is how you you play a damaging support character. Oftentimes I think of support characters as clerics, right? Casting healing spells, right. casting buff spells, which is a fine way to play. Nothing wrong with that except for maybe healing. Don't heal as much as you think you should. But the way that I love to play support is to be in the midst of it, in the mix of combat, and making my other party members shine. Making other people in my party look like they're just amazing. Uh, giving ways to make what they're doing better. So I'm when your wizard uh, casts ranged martial characters too, yeah, yeah, if you got if you got some guy stuck things... in a web or or some other control spell, then that really enhances uh, you know, your your archers there. Yeah, it keeps our party members safe as well. You know, the best healing is preventing the damage entirely, right? Think me, if your enemies, that. if your enemies spend the entire combat stuck in a web. Not doing any damage, are they? No, unless they have range yeah. options or spells. Yeah, spells really are the thing where web doesn't work super well. Ranged options, though, they're still suffering disadvantage because they're restrained. All right. So, if you're fighting spellcasters, though, that's a great point. Let's talk about that because that's where spike growth comes into play. 
Now, spike growth doesn't have any restraining effects. It is still difficult terrain, which is great. But instead, it deals 2d4 damage for every five feet that a creature moves in its area. Now, is that forced or unforced? Movement? Forced or unforced. Willing or not, they take that damage. So, the 2d4 damage per five feet, that averages out to about five damage per five feet they move. 15 feet of movement means that we're dealing 15 points of extra damage <laughs> on top of our attack. That's more than a great weapon master. Yeah. Now, we can only do it once per turn because Gathered Swarm says we can only inflict this strength saving throw once per turn. So we're still not dealing as much damage as them. But we're comparing. And that's yeah. great. So spike growth is wonderful. It, Like I said, it does create difficult terrain, so it is difficult for something someone to get out of. And we can crack that spellcaster back into it, have them take a whole bunch of damage, make them stuck in an area they don't want to be. Spike growth's area, by the way, is huge. Mm -hmm. Web is a 20-foot diameter. Spike growth is a 20-foot radius. It is wow. twice the size. It will fill most battle map rooms. So you actually have to be careful with how you place it. Sometimes it's too big. Sometimes your whole party also ends up in it. So be careful about that, as with all spells. Absolutely. So let's move on, because we've spent plenty of time here. All right, so let's keep going. We're at level 7 now. So we're a Fighter 1, a Ranger 5, and a Warlock 1. Warlock? Okay, that's yes. interesting. Let's multi-class some more, why don't we? <laughs> so, Warlock 1. This is this why is we why took we... a little bump in Charisma? Yes. You have to have a 13 in Charisma to multi-class into Warlock. Okay. So, Warlock 1. We get a subclass of Warlock right at level 1. And we will be taking the Undead Patron. Oh, not now, normally a popular one. Not normally, although I would argue it should be. As we will be picking up the ability called Form of Dread. Now, Form of Dread is a really cool ability. It, uh, it takes a bonus action to activate. So let's talk about something real quick, because we have a lot of bonus actions here, don't we? Shillelagh is a bonus action. Polar yeah, Master is a bonus action. Last for a minute. So Exactly. Right. So what I recommend doing is talking to your DM and saying, hey, my character, when they know danger is near, is casting Shillelagh. They're keeping their Shillelagh up. They're keeping it ready. That will serve you in most circumstances. So Form of Dread, let's talk about it. It gives us a couple of neat abilities. First, it says that when we activate it, we get temporary hit points equal to a D10 plus our Warlock level. That won't be too much for us. Maximum of 11, minimum of 2. So, yeah. big swing there. But we'll take it. It's nice. Yeah. We are immune to the Frightened Condition. That's actually really good for a melee character. Uh... Melee characters are shut down entirely by the Frightened Condition. The Frightened Condition says that you cannot move closer to the source of your fear. Meaning that if an enemy frightens us, we can't get close to them and we can't hit them. Right. Um, Unless we pull out our magic world... stones. Yes. And even then, we're attacking with disadvantage. So Frightened is really bad. And having flat immunity to it is wonderful. But the even better part of Form of Dread is that once during each of our turns, when we hit a creature with an attack, oh, this all sounds familiar, you can force it to make a wisdom saving throw, and if the saving throw fails, the target is frightened of you until the end of your next turn. So, let's run through our scenario again. Right, so we before, you do, our... before you do, uh, yeah. how long does this form of dread last? Oh, the form of dread lasts for one minute. Okay. So, one combat. Yeah. Um, and we have a number of uses of it equal to our proficiency bonus. So we'll actually have enough uses for it throughout our entire campaign, throughout the entire campaign, even though we're really only taking one level of Warlock for now. Mm -hmm. So let's run through our scenario again. Sure. We have our web or our spike growth. Our enemies just come out of that. We run up to them. We smack them over the head. They get knocked back 15 feet. Now they're frightened. 
Now they cannot get closer to us to get out of that web or that spike growth. Their only option is to run away. And yeah. Running away through is fine by terrain. me. Yeah. yeah, through difficult terrain. That's fine by me. I'm perfectly fine with my enemies running away from me. Sure. So the frightened condition means that they are super stuck in whatever they're in. Frightened also imposes disadvantage to ability checks. Now, when we... I have to look at web again, but I'm pretty sure that you make an ability check in order to actually resist and get out of the web. Really? I, I'm going to look that up right now. Yeah, look that up for me real quick. Double check on that. I just thought of that, actually. I didn't write that down. I just thought of that. <laughs> I can't remember if it's a saving throw or an ability check. As an ability check, that's amazing for us. All right, so dexterity saving throw to... Uh, it's a dexterity saving throw initially. I know that. Yeah. Creature restrained by the webs can use its action to make a strength check against your... Uh... You don't see anything about an ability score yep. or uh, ability... Well, no, it's, it's a, oh, it is I mean, a strength oh, check. Oh, strength check. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. So thinking, that means yeah. they have they now have disadvantage on that check. Oh, Nice. So they're definitely not getting out of that web now. <laughs> so we can do this once per turn. And keep in mind, the Frighten only lasts until the end of our next turn. So basically, it's one turn of Frighten for that creature. Which is fine. That's really all we need it for. Yeah. If they're, um, I mean, they're going to be stuck there. <laughs> yeah. And if you want to, you can just hit them again and make them afraid of you again. So really, you do whatever you want with it. It'll work no matter what. So that'll be level seven for us. Um, in terms of spells from Warlock, pick your favorites. Get a couple of utility cantrips. Um, and for first level spells, like I said, pick your favorites. We got a first level pack slot. That's great. We'll use it for good, very probably. Um, <laughs> I gotta wonder now, though. With this, uh, all right. You start off as a fighter. All right, I'm rough and tough. I like fighting, and then, but then I, I hang out in the woods for a while. And uh, picked up some ranger levels. And where, where is this warlock going from? It's like <laughs> I went, I went through a phase. That's for you to decide. Yeah, 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 That's yeah. the wonderful thing about multiclassing. The flavor of it is free. You do what you want. Talk to your DM about this. If you have this planned out, if you have multiclasses planned out in your head, talk to your DM. Ask them. Say, hey, how do you think I should incorporate this? <laughs> Maybe this warlock level is a really dark turn for your character. <laughs> Sure. Maybe this is like maybe this is like a really bad maybe something really bad happens to them and they reach out for any sort of power that they can muster. Uh, you there, there are some people that have problems with a lot of multiclassing. I just say you're not creative enough. Oh yeah, I don't have a problem with it. I, I think it's <laughs> it if is anything funny, it right. builds a uh, you know it, it's an opportunity to uh, yeah tell the story of your character. Yes, and here's where the story gets really weird, because now we're level eight. Is this? Yeah, this is where uh, the other. <laughs> this is the swerve option. back. Yeah. So we're a fighter one, a ranger five, a warlock one, and a cleric <laughs> one. Not just any cleric, a life cleric. See, this is I. I, I think this all fits in. You you went through this phase, and then oh, whoa, whoa, that got dark. And you, you yeah. fish tail the other way. <laughs> Make a hard turn right. <laughs> no. You find Jesus, just like all those yes. guys in prison. Yes. So, cleric one. Uh, we're taking life cleric. Now, life cleric has a level one ability called Disciple of Life that bumps our healing spells. Uh, basically, um, any spell cast that restores hit points restores additional hit points equal to two plus the spell's level now okay, so. that's a fine feature we like that life clerics enjoy having that its interaction with goodberry is very interesting so goodberry has creates berries that heal for one hit point per berry creates 10 of them per spell level so if we create 10 berries, they all now heal four hit points each. Yeah, that's pretty incredible. So we are going from 10 hit points of healing to 40. 
Um, yeah, that, there's is, no no dice rolled. That's just straight no up. No dice rolled. Yeah. Yes. Now, of course, you can only heal one hit point at a time, so this is not in combat healing. Like I said, you can use it to pick somebody up from zero hit points, and that's fine. But you know, you're not you. Rules is written. You cannot take a handful of berries and scarf <laughs> them down. You can't. Don't. This is already powerful enough. You don't need to do that. Yeah, that's fine. That's something for um, out of combat. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Now, I will say there's a bit of internet discourse as to whether or not this works based on the wording of Disciple of Life and the wording of Goodberry. Now, I won't get into the full details of it because we do that. We'll be here all day. But yeah, this I will isn't tell you the really deed. the crux of the build. But yes. this is a, a it's fun. not the crux of the build. We, right, we I've, I've said before. I, well, I'm, I'm agreeing with you. I've said before that we're not a damage dealer. We're more of a support character, really. A combat support character. This is amplifying our support capabilities. Yeah. That's the point of this level. If, I will tell you, the DMD designers have said that this would work at their tables. Now, if your DM disagrees, just don't take this level. Just skip this, and I'll tell you that the next couple of levels are going into fighter. Just go straight into fighter. It's fine. You'll miss out on some, but it won't kill the character. We have what we need for the character right now. We're at the point now where we're enhancing it. We're making it yeah. better. This is one way to make it better. It's not a necessary level, but it's a really good level if you can take it. So, um, now, um, go ahead. I'm thinking that we're mainly focused on area of effect control spells. Or, uh, are there any, like if you didn't want to do the Goodberry thing, um, are there any other options for you know getting access to other of these control spells well we're going to be getting some more through ranger we will be eventually taking more ranger levels the great thing about the control spells we have now web and spike growth mm -hmm. is they're good all yeah. the way up into high tiers these are second level spells that are good now and will stay good for a long time we will eventually be getting better spells and we'll get them at the levels where we'll need them. Right. So Cleric, um, it does give us some spells, and it does increase our spellcasting ability, which is great because we will be able to have more spell slots, have higher level spell slots, all very useful. Um, other things we get from Cleric real quick, um, some cantrips. I recommend Guidance. Great cantrip for out of combat ability checks and your favorite of whatever whatever else. Um, first level spells, bless is fine. If if your web or your spike growth isn't going to work for that combat, bless is always a good fallback. Mm -hmm. And again, take your favorites. We're mostly here for the first level cleric feature. So, levels nine through eleven, I said it already. We're taking some more fighter levels. Um, we are going to grab Action Surge at Fighter Level 2, which is great. That allows us to cast our control spell and make attacks in the same turn. Oh, that's good. Yeah, that's very useful. We can only do that once per short rest, but that's normally enough times. So, that's a great, great, great benefit for us. Um, we also uh, gain a subclass. Now, I had a lot of a lot of difficulty deciding the subclass for this. I'll tell you, if you were able to roll for stats and got a really good dexterity or strength along with this build that you could also throw on there, like if you rolled crazy stats, battle master fighters get a maneuver called pushing attack, <laughs> which forces a save based on either strength or dexterity. That's the reason we can't really use that here, because our save would be so low. Yeah. But if you can do that, that adds an additional 10 feet to the push. So now we're talking about a 25 feet push. That's just crazy. And so, but we we can't do that. No, that's uh that's just something if you did roll really good stats. Right, right. We will instead take the rune knight. Now, rune knight gives us a couple of things. It gives us the runes. That's in the name. Uh we will be taking we get two choices. We'll be taking the Cloud Rune and the Frost Rune. Cloud Rune is the most obvious pick because everybody loves the Cloud Rune. You get to take an attack that an enemy makes 
and make it target something else. No save. Hmm. Um, I once had someone in my in my in one of my campaigns who was playing a rune knight had a phase spider crit his ranger friend for what would have been over 50 damage and redirected the attack to a second face spider and instantly killed that face spider <laughs> from full health now oh, obviously wow. that's a best case scenario yeah. but that is the power of this feature <laughs> Um, I love to like like in that example. I recommend saving it for when you see a big crit hit one of your friends, and have it target something else. Even if there's no one else in your party, and excuse me, if, if there's no one else on the enemy enemy side, and you can just have it redirect to target your barbarian, even somebody, that's pretty. Somebody good. can take the hit. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty good too. So that's obvious. Everybody loves the cloud room. Who's played with it? Highly recommended. The Frost Rune, though, is a bit more contentious because Frost is normally the last pick. Um, Frost Rune gives us a, a bonus action that we can activate to give us a minute of plus two to strength and constitution checks and saving throws. That's not a lot. So why are we picking it? Well, the know. other two runes available to us, uh, which are Fire and Stone, both force saving throws based on our constitution. Our constitution is not super high. It'll get better, but it'll never be great. Mm -hmm. Those saving throws are going to be super unreliable. That's why I don't recommend those. And we do actually make use of Frost, because it gives us a plus two to our constitution saving throws. We're already proficient in them, but we're never going to have a very good constitution score with this character. We'll have a 14 by level 20. That's good, not great. Yeah, But this gives us a plus two, further increasing our concentration checks. So this is a good bonus action to use if you know you're going to be going into combat. It's a it's not as good as making another polearm master attack, which also uses our bonus action. So if you're already in combat, yeah, I don't but, recommend using this. How did you say this last a minute? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So if you can see a combat is about to break out, activate the frost rune and you'll be good to go for that combat. If a combat comes on you by surprise, just don't worry about it. Save it for the next combat. Um, so that's why we'll take Frost Rune. It's useful for us, which is rare because most people don't, don't ever take it. Uh, they also, these two runes give us an advantage on a couple of ability checks, which is nice, but, you know, that's not what we're taking them for. No. The big thing that Rune Knight gets us, though, is their ability to grow large. So oh, for a bonus action... Again, another bonus action. We're a very bonus action heavy character, but the thing is, all these bonus actions are useful in different encounters. Right. So we'll, they, won't, they don't overlap nearly as much as you would think they do. So the um, Rune Knight allows us to grow to large size. It also gives us an extra D6 of damage once per turn, which is very nice. We take it. Again, not building for damage, but we still want to do as good of damage as we can. Now, the reason growing big is useful to us is because at uh, fighter level 4, character level 11 we'll be taking Crusher so we're dealing bludgeoning damage with our quarter staff, so we qualify yeah. for Crusher that's good um, we can take Crusher and it'll give us a plus 1 to our constitution, we can do strength or constitution, obviously we're taking constitution that bumps us up from a 13 to a 14 that's why we started with an odd number so we love that and it also gives us a five foot shove, but that five foot shove can only be used when we attack a creature that is no more than one size larger than us. Okay. So, as a medium sized creature, that would mean that we are only able to shove large creatures. Anything huge or gargantuan is out of the picture. With Rune Knight, we become large, which means now we can attack huge or smaller creatures. Still can't. We still can't do the five foot shove on gargantuan creatures. Well, that's not going to come into play super often. But... Not super often. And we still can do our swarm keeper move to gargantuan creatures. Yeah. So let's talk about why this five foot of extra shove on an attack is great. Obviously, we can double up on the swarm keeper move for a total of 20 feet of movement. 
That's cool. We like that. Yeah, it might yeah, be yeah. useful sometimes. The bigger impact is that we can attack once, use a Swarm Keeper movement to move someone 15 feet, and then attack again and use the Crusher movement to attack somebody else and move them five feet. Now we can move two different creatures on the same turn. For different amounts, yes, but sometimes that'll be exactly what we need. Now, if you can, if exact... it's two people in your web, then that's awesome. Exactly, exactly. So obviously, it is hard to put onto paper exactly how impactful this is. You know, I can't give you a damage per round calculation for this. You know, for pushing people into spike growth, sometimes we're pushing them in 10 feet, sometimes we're pushing them in 5 feet. You know, it, it varies. We're not going to be doing the same amount of damage every turn. We're not going to be having the same amount of usefulness every turn. Well, but, I mean, yeah. But the damage. But it gives us flexibility. And there's also intangible uncalculable damage you know they might not have uh, been easy as easy to hit for the barbarian if not being held in the web you know that's yep yep that counts. yeah when you're restrained when you're restrained uh things have an advantage against attacks again uh, right. advantage on attacks against you yeah yeah there's like i said we're dealing in intangibles here as you said it's we're a support character we're going to be making the rest of our party better we may not add a ton of damage ourselves directly, but we are making our party as a whole deal immeasurably more damage and take much less damage. Mm -hmm. So that's the reason we'll take the fighter levels there. Um, let's move on because we are almost to the end here. We are talking about levels 12 through 15. We're actually finally going back to Ranger now. <laughs> So we will be a Fighter 4, Ranger 9, Warlock 1, Cleric 1. So we've gone from Ranger 5 to Ranger 9. So we're taking four more Ranger levels. Okay. So at 7th level Ranger, we get Rising Tide from Swarm Keeper. This gives us a flying speed of 10 feet for one minute that we can activate, you guessed it, as a bonus action. <laughs> now, a 10-foot flying speed doesn't sound that impressive. But you can make it a 20-foot flying speed with the Long Strider spell. Now, 20-foot flying speed is actually very good. That gets us well off the ground, away from melee attacks, if we want to be. Say, for example, you're fighting something that uh, perhaps maybe like a Merolith, which is a very high-level enemy that can make nine attacks per turn. But only in melee. At that point, I'm getting out of there. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I'll I'll hit it, smack it away, and then I'm flying up 20 feet where it can't hit me anymore. Or, I mean, if you've been playing this effectively, hopefully when you smack it, you're restraining it somehow. And, uh, yes, yes, hopefully. And the rest of your party can beat the snot out of it. Yeah, hopefully. But again, we are relying on saving throws, so sometimes things don't work out. Yeah. The dice, this is, you know, the dice can still screw us over. So, it's good to have backup plans. That flying speed also allows us, this is one of my favorite things, we can cast spike growth. And if an enemy is already inside that spike growth, we can fly just over the spike growth and hit them in melee while they're in the spike growth, pushing them around in the spike growth while we're not taking any damage because we're above it. In a swarm of bats, yes. In a swarm of bats, yes. Again, the flavor of all this is wonderful. I love it so much. Um, we will at um at our next our next uh, ability score improvement, which will be Ranger level eight, character level uh, fourteen. We'll finally bump our wisdom up to a twenty. So we'll take a plus two in wisdom, going from an eighteen to a twenty. Increases our DC, increases our attack, increases our damage, whole bunch of stuff. Very useful to us. We have all the feats that we need now, so now we can bump our wisdom, and finally get it to a twenty. The um. The other big things that we get uh, from this love from these uh, ranger levels is we get third level ranger spells. Yay! So now we're finally getting the higher level spells that I talked about that are going to be useful for us. I am definitely picking up conjure animals. There is a lot of discourse as to how table friendly this spell is, as conjuring eight raptors is a lot. I admit. Um, what I recommend for you is to 
be as table friendly with the spell as possible. Perhaps say, hey, a uh, wizard, here's two raptors for you. You can say what they want, what you want them to do on your turn. Here, barbarian, here's two raptors for you. Fighter, here's two raptors for you, and I'll take these two raptors. That's what I like to do with the spell. Okay. It yeah. shares it around the party, gives everybody something fun to do, and it makes it much more manageable for the DM. So it is possible to be table friendly with the spell. Just plan for it and tell your DM that you're going to be casting it. That helps a lot too. Not surprising your DM in general is a good idea. <laughs> so, Hundred Animals, very good. Plant growth. If the environment provides for it, plant growth, you have in order to cast it, you have to be in an area where there is already plants. Grass qualifies. Grass is fine. If you if you're in a grass field, that's enough. In a dungeon, probably not. But yeah, if somebody, you're in the area where somebody asked me uh in, in one of the comments to these videos, if uh carrying around a potted plant counts. I'm thinking not. I guess it would it would it would make it, it would you would cast the spell and it would make that five foot cube that that potted plant occupies grown, I guess. But probably not the rest of the area. <laughs> um I have I did see though one druid that uh carried a bag of seeds with him everywhere that he would take an action to scatter, then on his next turn would cast plant growth. At that point, you're taking two turns to cast the spell. I think that's fair. Yeah, that's uh, but, that sounds kind of reasonable. Your DM. Yeah, but that's up to your DM. So, but let's talk about what plant growth does do in the right scenario. It creates a huge area of super difficult terrain. It costs enemies four times as much movement in this area. So, to move five feet in difficult terrain takes ten feet of movement. In plant growth, takes 20 feet of movement. Um, yeah, plant that growth, means... Nuts. Yeah, it is crazy. It doesn't do anything else, it just does that. But that's enough. That's enough, yeah. Yeah. Um, there's also a very neat thing. If you're fighting on a grid, which most people are nowadays, and you're fighting exclusively large or larger creatures... You can cast the plant growth, and it says that we can choose what plants in the area are affected by the spell, meaning we can create an array of difficult terrain where we have difficult terrain, not difficult terrain, difficult terrain, not difficult terrain, and do that in an array as a big square. That means that we, as medium-sized creatures, can weave through that difficult terrain and are never affected by it. Yeah. But those large creatures that take up four spaces on that grid cannot. So it basically turns the whole field into super difficult terrain for our enemies and free movement for us. <laughs> so plant growth, amazing when you can cast it. If you're in an area where it doesn't work, uh, we have other spells. Web and spike growth are still good. Sure. And um, the last thing I'll mention is we do get Revivify. So oh. that's cool. We'll take it. Um, we're almost done here. We're at level 16. We're actually going to dip back for one more level of Warlock. Oh, my. Um, yeah, we'll didn't, get a Didn't second... learn the first time. Yeah, yeah. I, again, maybe we have come towards the end of our campaign and we are finding we still need more power. Maybe a Sararak is about to destroy the world, and we'll take whatever we can get. So, uh, we will take this. We get a second pack slot. Great for good berry and other spells. Because we can regain them on a short rest. Um, so think about that. You are getting 80 hit points of good berry per short rest. So yeah, we can cast it twice with our pack slots. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. So, uh, for invocations, because we get invocations at this level, I'll take Eldritch Mind, giving us advantage on concentration checks. We already had proficiency in it, now we've got advantage. Um, and for the second, pick your favorite. I'll take Misty Visions, as Silent Image as a cantrip is crazy good, and I am a personally a, character, uh, a player that loves illusions. I love being creative with them. I love seeing how far I can push them. I think it's great. It's a ton of fun. But there is a case for not taking Misty Visions here because these high levels, 
a lot of enemies have blind sight or true sight, which sees through them. Yeah. So I, I struggle if, with uh, illusions. Yeah. If you're finding that you are in a campaign where most of your enemies have that, just take something else. There's plenty of great options. And I'm sure you can find something that's going to suit your campaign. So we'll finish off here with going level 17 to 20, finishing in Ranger. Um, there's a lot of ways you can take the character at this point. Again, we're we for quite a few levels now, we've just been improving what we're already doing. This is just the way I've chosen to continue sure, to improve. Sure. You can take more fighter levels. You can take more warlock levels. You can take more cleric levels. You can take something else. You can take druid levels. You know, do what you want, but I chose ranger levels. Um, we'll finish on ranger. It gives us our 11th level subclass feature, which allows us that when we push someone with our uh, 15 feet of forced movement, they're also knocked prone, <laughs> which is, oh. I mean, it's it's just really bad for them. They're afraid, they're prone, they're stuck in a web. It's, it's a bad day. <laughs> <laughs> so it really limits their movement. Um, keep in mind, if a creature has a movement speed of zero, which they do if they're restrained, they can't stand up. Because it costs half your movement to stand up. If your movement wow. is zero, you can't pay that half. Wow, that's that's brutal. Yeah. So, uh, that's really useful for us. Um, and I will say at 20th level, we don't get a capstone. Instead, we get Conjure Woodland Beings, which might as well be a capstone. Yeah, that's, that's pretty good. Um, Conjure Woodland Beings allows us to summon eight pixies. We'll use half of them to cast Fly on our party of four, and the other half to cast Polymorph, turning our entire party into flying T-Rexes, and we go off into the sunset. <laughs> that's, a, that's one <laughs> option, yes. That's my option. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that's a real thing you can do. And Normally, I tell people that get Conjure Woodland Beings to rain, restrain yourself with the spell. Summon things that are reasonable. But it's 20th level. The wizard yeah. has Wish. This is not nearly as powerful as Wish. Uh, I mean, nothing is, but this is... I mean, this is getting all those close. Pixies, all those pixies have a, a ton of spells. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's it's crazy. You got how yeah, many, so eight pixies, eight pixies, and how many spells do they have? Like just, they've got fly, they've got polymorph, they've got a whole bunch of stuff. You can even have them all just cast polymorph on your enemies. Yeah. You turn them all into turtles. Like that's mass polymorph. Mass polymorph is a ninth level spell. <laughs> so yeah, it's that's our capstone. And I'm very happy with it. Oh yeah, that's a good one. That's that's a lot better than uh, a bunch of uh, actual capstones. It is, yeah. The ranger capstone is awful. Let us add our wisdom to the damage roll once per turn. Yeah, horrible. Um, so I know. Let's wrap it up. To summarize, our build seeks to push enemies all around the battlefield into harmful effects created by either ourself or our teammates. Um, we amplify this by making them frightened, which makes them stuck wherever they are. Um, and it gives us a ton of control over their position on the battlefield. We've got great defenses. We've got a half plate and a shield. That's a, our AC of 19 without any magic items. So we're good on defense. We keep enemies away from us, meaning that we shouldn't be taking a ton of attacks. Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't dive into a group of enemies with this character. I'd be selective with who I chose to attack. But either way, we're going to deal okay damage, and we're going to have a wide range of options to cover a ton of different combat encounters. We've got options for flying enemies. We've got options for huge enemies. We've got options for enemies with good saving throws. We've got options for a ton of stuff. So this is the kind of... It, 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 this is a support build that is centered on combat support. And I feel it's hard to replicate. And it's all thanks to Shalele allowing us to focus so much on our wisdom that we can make our save DC so good that we can, you know, 
be able to just completely ignore the normal stats that people have to focus on in order to make attack rolls. I got one question before we yeah. wrap up. Now, this this build is focused so much on pushing creatures around. Why did we never take the telekinetic feat? Because it requires a bonus action. <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. That is not a good argument for you to be making. Everything is so, required a bonus action. Yes. Here's the thing, though. Polar Master is already giving us the our default bonus action. Mm -hmm. Our default bonus action is to make another attack. We have a default. We don't need another default. Now, I will tell you, if you want to take Telekinetic as another option to push people, if you're finding that you have three things you want to push every turn, maybe your combat encounters are just working out like that. Telekinetic is a fine choice. You, you can take it and Crusher and have be able to move three things per turn, potentially. I'm just thinking if you if you're I mean you're not doing this in a vacuum. The rest of your party is doing stuff. They're fighting other creatures. You're facing off against this one guy. Bam! You hit him 15 feet into a web. Yeah, he might not be getting out next turn. Uh, what are you, what are you doing? You kind of sitting there with nothing to do. Ah, oh, I could just boink that guy into the web too. Ah, yeah. It's entirely that that might be something that you want to do as well. Like I said, I've provided an option for how to build the character. I found though that it was very difficult to fit more feats onto this character. Mm -hmm. Um with, that is one problem with multiclassing. When you're multiclassing, you're delaying your feat and ability score improvement progression. So, you know, if you if you find that, yeah, telekinetic is something I want, go for it. But I would still take all the feats that I've already mentioned mm -hmm. because they're sort of central to the build. Telekinetic might be a good choice right at the end of your character's life. That's maybe kind of you... what I'm thinking. Yeah, maybe if you if you didn't take that cleric level because your DM said they didn't like how the Goodberry thing worked. Mm -hmm. If you instead took another level of ranger, that would give you another feat selection. So then you could take it. Hmm. So. Like I said, there are different knobs that you can turn on this character to fit it to your campaign, to your play style. This is just what I've come up with. Um, ah, and great. I... Yeah, I I personally want to be attacking with Polearm Master with my bonus action most of the time. Yeah, have you got a enemy there? Yep. Yep. And so, any other questions before we end off? No, I think, uh, I think that was pretty thorough. Have I convinced you that Shillelagh can be used to make a good build? Absolutely, yes. All uh, right, great. That was the goal. All right. Uh, well, I'm looking forward to the next one, and uh, I hope people have found this one useful. Um, let us know what you think down in the comments, viewers. And uh, thank you for watching. And thank you, Cameron, for hopping on for another build. Thank you so much for having me. All right. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching. If you found this helpful, informative, or entertaining, I'd really appreciate it if you hit the like button below. You needn't smash it, a gentle tap will suffice. If you want to see more videos like this, subscribe to the channel. And make sure you check out the links in the description where you'll find my Caverns and Creatures series of comedy fantasy novels, Sam's full review of the spell, and other fun things.